it's time for laughs with Mr. Thomas. All right, all right, all right. Here we go with functions, chapter three in the higher course. This I have split across seven lessons. There is six and then the review. And I want to start off with a recap from National 5 and then look at what is known as the domain and the range. So first of all, I want to think, right, well, what actually is a function? So if you remember way back in primary school, you had number machines. So you had something that looks like Bertha. You always had some number that went into this machine. There was some process, so something happened to it. And then some number popped out the other end. That was your number machine, and it's really just a very simple function. When you went into secondary, again, you had a number, and then something happened to it, and a number popped out. So it looked more like an arrow diagram, but it's still just a number machine. For both of these, there is an input, there is a process, and there is an output. So something goes in, there's a process, and then there's an output. What we're going to do from now on is we're going to be calling the input the domain, and we're going to call the output the range. So really the domain is just the x value that you're putting in, and the output, or the range, is really the y value that you're getting out. A lot of the time people get mixed up, which one's the domain, which one is the range. I always just remember it's alphabetical. The same way x and y are alphabetical, x is first and y is second, with d for domain and r for range, d is first, r is second, so the domain is x and the range is y. Really, for any of these, the function shows us how the domain, so the number going in, links to one and only one member of the range. So if you put a number in, then you're going to get one number out. The way you write functions, the way you did it last year, is you had an f, then you had brackets, and then you had an x, which you read as f of x. You can use other letters as well, and I'm sure we came across them. You could have g of x, or h of x, or k of x. What was that? Mazamel. No, you cannot have mazamel of x. Just put a letter in front of it, and h of x, g of h, g of x, and so on. Really, from there, you can then replace x in each function. So, quick recap. Last year, you had something like this. You were given f of x equals x squared minus 7, and you had to find the value of f of 5. So the way you did that is you started off with your function, f of x equals x squared minus 7, and you wanted to replace x with something else. Here we're replacing it with 5, we've got f of 5. So what we're doing is we're replacing x with 5 on the left hand side, so on the right hand side, wherever you see an x, replace it with a 5. So instead of x squared, we've got 5 squared, and then the minus 7 would just stay as it is. Work that out then, so 5 squared is 25, take away 7, gives us 18, and that's how we did that one. Let's try one that's a wee bit trickier. Next example, given g of x equals 3x squared minus x, find the value of g of x minus 2. So again, that's the function that we are starting with. We've got g of x equals 3x squared minus x, but we're replacing x with x minus 2. So on the right-hand side, wherever you see an x, replace it with x minus 2. What you're best doing is substituting in, but putting brackets around what you're subbing in. So we've got 3 times, replace x with x minus 2, so we've got 3 times x minus 2 squared. Then take away and replace x with x minus 2, so let's take away x minus 2. To work this out, well, we're multiplying by 3, we've got the squared, and then we we're taking this away. Think back to bid mass, where you always do the indices first. So, multiplying that out, you could do it any way you want. You could do 3 times x and 3 times negative 2, and then multiply that by the x minus 2. The way I'm doing it, though, is just doing 3 times, and then x minus 2 times x minus 2. So, x times x is x squared. That would give us minus 2x minus 2x is minus 4x, and then negative 2 times negative 2 gives us plus 4. And we've still got minus x times, uh, sorry, x minus 2. From there, multiply out the brackets, so 3 times x squared, 3 times minus 4x, 3 times 4, and then be very, very careful with this bit. We're taking away the x, and we're taking away the negative 2, which will make that a plus 2. 
Okay, make sure you don't write down negative two there. You could always treat it as just one in front of the brackets there and then multiplying it out. So negative one times x is negative one x. Negative one times negative two will make that plus two. From there, gather your like terms, gather the x squared, the x's and the numbers, and that would be your answer. Let's try one that's a wee bit trickier still. Example number three. If h of x equals x over 2x plus 3, simplify h of 1 over x. So for this one, the way you want to do this is we're just starting off with our function. h of x equals x over uh, 2x plus 3. And again, look at the left, we're replacing x with 1 over x. So on the right hand side, wherever you see an x, replace it with 1 over x. So on the top, you should... Let's get rid of that. So on the top, you should have 1 over x. On the bottom, we've got 2 times x, but replacing x with 1 over x, so it's 2 times 1 over x. And then on the end, we've got a plus 3. Well, plus 3 will just stay as plus 3. It's not in terms of x. From there, well, the top, we can't really simplify. The bottom, you've got 2 times 1 over x, so treat the 2 as 2 over 1, multiply the numerators and denominators, and that would give us 2 over x. So we've got 1 over x over 2 over x plus 3. What you could do is leave it as that, but nobody likes fractions within fractions. It makes that very, very, very ugly. So you can make it a bit more attractive. And the way you can do that is by getting rid of the fractions within the fractions. So to do that, you want to think, well, this term here is 1 divided by x. This term here is a 2 divided by x. This term here is 3. I can't do anything with 3. But to get rid of this divide by x, what you could do is you could times by x. Again, here, to get rid of the divide by x, you could times by x. However, if you do that, you would have to multiply every single term by x. And you can do that. You can multiply every single term in a fraction by the same uh, number or letter, whatever you like, and it doesn't change it. For example, if you think, well, a half, you could multiply both those numbers by 4 to give us 4 over 8. 4 over 8 is still a half. You can multiply them both then by 10 to get 40 over 80. It's still a half. So as long as you multiply every single term by the same thing, it doesn't change the fraction at all. All these would still be a half. So multiply every single term by x. 1 over x times x. Well, the divide by x and then times by x would cancel out, leaving me with 1. 2 divided by x times by x. Well, divide by x times by x would cancel out, leaving me with 2. And the 3, you have to multiply the 3 as well. Otherwise, it will not make sense and you'll get the wrong answer. So multiply that by x and that gives us 3x. And that there, as I'm sure you will agree, is a lot more attractive. So that would be your final answer. Never leave it where you have fractions within fractions. It's just very, very messy. Okay. One last bit that I want to throw in is restrictions on the domain. And what I mean by this is sometimes a function will be undefined for a certain value of x. And this is normally because of one of two reasons. So what it means is there's certain values of x, if you work out f of x, that you put a number in and you can't actually work out an answer. And this is normally because either you cannot take the square root of a negative, so you might end up subbing in a value for x and you get square root of negative 5, which you can't do. Or you may end up dividing by 0, which again you cannot do. Every calculator in the world explodes when you try it. So let's try a couple of examples then with that. So for these next two examples, think about two things. First of all, find out what values of x, f of x, is undefined. So I put s in brackets there, so you might have just one value, or it might be multiple values. And also, state a suitable domain. Remember, the domain is the x, so what values of x can x be? So, example one. If we have f of x equals the square root of x minus 3. First of all, think what value of x would make that undefined. So... You've got the square root of something. I mean, I suppose you could put any number in there and it would work out as the square root of something. But remember, you can't get the square root of a negative. So what you would say is it's undefined when this x minus 3 ends up being less than 0. 
Some of you might want to put equal zero as well, but if it was equal to zero, well, you could get the square root of zero, which is just zero. Zero times zero is zero. So zero would work. It's when it's less than zero that it wouldn't. So if x minus three was less than zero, add three to both sides, remove the negative three over, and you would get x is less than three. So it would be undefined when x is less than three because you would end up taking the square root of a negative, which you cannot do this year. Also think about the domain, state a suitable domain, what values of x, uh, what value can x be? Well, if x cannot be less than three, then you could say it could be more than three. And remember, it could also be equal as well. So it has to be more than or equal to three. Example two. So for this one, same set of questions. Think about what value will make f of x undefined. So with this one, f of x equals one over x bracket x had five. Again, you can put in any number you like for x, but think about the restrictions. You can and not, bleh, you cannot in a fraction divide by zero. So you would say it would be undefined if the x times the x had five was equal to zero. Think back to National 5 when you were solving these. You had x bracket x add 5 equals 0. If you split that into two parts, you could say that means x equals 0 or x add 5 equals 0. Therefore, that means x would equal 0 or x would equal negative 5. What that means then is that x cannot be 0 and it can't be negative 5. So it would be undefined if it was 0 or negative 5 because you would end up dividing by 0 and you cannot divide by 0. What value can x be? Well, really, x can be anything at all apart from 0 or negative 5. So what you would say is this, x and then this thing that looks like an e and then r, which means x could be any real number, which means it could be any number you like whatsoever, but it can't be 0 and it can't be negative 5. So the equals with a line through it means it cannot be 0 or negative 5. This bit here we're going to do more of just in the next lesson but it just means x can be any number you like, apart from zero or negative five, because you would end up dividing by zero. That's it for the domain and the range just now, and then we recap. Try some of this before we move on to looking at more of the notation in the next lesson. Try some of these, any problems, just let me know. Good luck.